Guys, our show today is jam-packed with a lot of information. We're talking about what an impact investor is. We're going to go over trusts and IRAs and how to turn around a community. We're also going to talk on a, basically a topic that's becoming very, very common today in the investing world, which is Airbnb, short-term rentals. And we're going to go over a specific strategy that high-level investors like our guests today are using, which is called Inherited Roth IRA. Let me introduce you to a mentor of mine, Walter Wolford. How you doing, Walter? Hey, Connor. Boy, we got a lot to talk about today, don't we? I know it. I know it. But you know so much. And so I figured who, who better to bring on here than you, right? But we also have one main reason we have this podcast today, which is to let everybody know about the Mississippi Affordable Housing Summit. You're going to find out more about that as we go on. But let's go ahead and talk about you here real quick, um, because a lot of people consider you to be one of the leading foremost experts on a lot of subjects, especially with creative financing, specifically trust and IRAs. All right, so where we're going to jump off? Which point? Well, I know, I know, we talked, we had you on here before, and we talked about you know you used to do a two note system, um, which I think a lot of people watched that podcast and thought that was a really good strategy. But you made a little bit of a tweak to it now, and you're doing more of a trust IRA type of transaction. Is that right? Right. Let me let me give the backdrop for those that are uh, haven't seen it before. I live in Jackson, Mississippi, old time investor, sixty three. I've been buying houses. For over 36 years. How old are you, Connor? Uh, let's not go there right now. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I bought my first 17 houses starting back in 1981 uh, with seller finance. That's the only way I could buy them. I didn't know you could go to the bank, and I couldn't at the time. And so I learned how to buy with seller financing, and we sell with seller financing most of the time. We it's It's... It's the best way to do it in my book. So here, 36 years later, I'm still doing what I started with. (laughs) When you're buying with seller financing, you get to create your own terms that you can live with. And when I'm selling, I'm selling to mainly to homeowners. And so they've got to be uh, underwritten for Dodd-Frank compliance. We know that. But uh, we we founded our market in Jackson. We're doing about one a week here. Uh, our group is, and what we do is we buy houses for cash, and a typical purchase would be something like thirty thousand dollars for a three bedroom, two bath, right. Right. Uh, in good shape, needs very little, and we would sell that for forty eight, uh, with three four thousand dollars down, and create a forty five thousand dollar eight percent, uh, hundred eighty month note. And so their payments, I I think in one in particular, we bought, uh, the tenants had been in there three years paying $800 a month. And when we sold it to them, their payments went to to $525. That includes taxes and insurance. So that's what we're, it's it's really an impact investor. You mentioned that word, and a lot of people don't know what that is, but that's that's a, a person or business that invests in a company or organization or nonprofit uh, and and for the social good, and it could be agriculture, environment, it could be uh, all sorts of things, school, but basic needs in the social arena is housing, and we have a national crisis right. of affordable housing here. Well, the problem is the lenders in our town won't make a loan less than $50,000, and mostly what I deal in is houses less than $50,000. So there are no lenders in our market that, that I have been able to identify in Jackson, Mississippi. Right. So, I mean, people hear those price points, 30000 or less, and they're like, oh, my gosh, that's great. But when you really look at the social dynamics of, and the human element of what's happening in the community, you know, it's quite disturbing sometimes to go into some of these neighborhoods. So what Walter's doing is he's helping turn around the area and creating home ownership instead of just – you know, selling them to investors who are going to rent them out because now people who own a property take care of that property. They take care of the yard and it just helps the community rise up. So I think what you're doing is great. I think more people should be doing this. Um, But I mean, it's just most people don't really have that type of market. Does this uh, way that you're doing your strategy now uh, work in a higher price market? Is it still just primarily focused on? It's it's price specific. And so, you know, not any technique works in every market. Right, really. Right. So the reason we do this uh, Mississippi Affordable Housing Summit dot com, you can go there and see about it. It's a once a year event, and I invite people. We'll have about a hundred people that'll come, and I'm showing them exactly what we do, and to, to to be able to 
sell one house a week to a homeowner. And we're create what we're doing is we're creating manufacturing notes, affordable housing notes, of which I I end up with a share of it, and somebody else ends up with a share. And we're not selling interest in the notes. What we've the the technique that we're using now is we're doing everything in a trust. Now you you know that kind of because you were out here last week, but so we buy out within a trust and vet the tenant, or we find a tenant, uh, and we qualify the tenant and then we sell the trust sells to the homeowner deed to the homeowner. And then the homeowner signs a note and deed of trust back to the trust. So the trust is the entity. Okay. And so that's, that's how we do. So we're creating a, a real estate owned asset. The trust owns real estate and converting it to a note. And that's, that's the only reason I would buy a house today is to convert it to a note. And the reason for that is it's, it's a great exit strategy too. Besides the social good work, I want, and so I'm 63 years old. My wife and I've been married 41 years. I want these income streams to take us to the to the afterlife. Okay, <laughs> that's what that's what I'm trying to do, and we're creating one one a week. So it's and by the way, we're doing this tax free. So we're doing these in IRAs and. When you're over 59 and a half, you can take it out tax free. So that's the, so we're using trust, seller financing, and IRAs to bring about the social change in the neighborhoods. And so when, when I invite people to come to the event, I mean they're going to pay. It's not a free invitation, right? <laughs> but um, what the, what they get is a, a network of 100 plus people from around the country that are interested in this. Right. And there's a lot of deal making going on and a lot of commerce, as you know. Yeah, I mean, you've got incredible guests coming down there as well. But what I think is really cool that you've done over the past couple of years is you've really automated this process. You've moved towards uh, videos and Podio and virtual assistants, which, you know, I think people who are not doing this right now are getting left behind in the business. Um, so I like when we were down there, you're talking about how you drive people to a video um, to screen them and you, you won't even let them move forward in the process unless they watch that video. Because if they can't watch a little video, how are they going to make a payment on a house, right? It's a, it's, it's a screening tool, but uh, so we drive them to our site, improvingjackson.com. And so we got signs out around town, improving Jackson, but there's no phone number on that sign. So they got to have the wherewithal to pull up their phone to type it in the browser and watch a video. <laughs> and if they won't do that, uh, it's, they, they're not going to make it. So right. that's just a hurdle. So I kind of had this aha moment that I'm wasting so much time showing people houses that are are not qualified. So I tell them on the video, 22 minute video, what it takes to be qualified to work with us. And so what happens is they follow the process and one or two people want us to contact and move forward per day. Instead of talking to a hundred people, I'm talking to one person. And not only that, I'm not talking to them, my virtual assistants talking to them. Right, right. So, are y'all staying? Um, are y'all using RMLOs and, and loan servicing companies? Or are you handling these in house, or how is yeah, somebody? We've got to do that if we're selling with right. uh, seller finance to homeowners, and that's not. I mean, listen, I, I I scrutinize and vet my buyers way heavier than the Dodd Frank does because <laughs> I'm the one extending the credit. Right. And see what what the the Dodd Frank does not allow for is the sniff test. <laughs> I'm talking about sitting belly to belly, talking, looking at somebody. And uh, to me, that's at least half of the <laughs> criteria is how well do you communicate with me and how well do I communicate with you? Right. I mean, <clears throat> a lot of people ask me, how do you know what to do in a lot of spots? And sometimes it's just experience and you got to go with your gut. Um, you just kind of, it's a sniff test, right? You feel it. You just know, you just know somehow, but that's, you just got to trust your gut. Now, what you have done is we'll talk a lot about that at the event, guys, to so make sure to go sign up at the Mississippi Affordable Housing Summit. But he's also transitioned to be one of the leading foremost investors on the front of this trend, which is Airbnb in Jackson, Mississippi. He's got them downtown. He's got them kind of scattered around the area. Um, let's touch on this a little bit because this was a transition you made, I guess, what, two years ago? And uh, it's been doing pretty well for you. Four yeah. years. More than four oh, years. Oh, wow, wow. Yeah, so he's he's been well, doing this. Yeah. Uh, right. So let me just say what. So I'm not. I have uh, five of them right now, and two more I'm getting ready, and that'll be enough for me right now. Right. Just the bottom line on Airbnb in our town, you it nets you a thousand dollars per month, net, 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 with the debt on it. 
Right. And rentals, rentals won't do that. Right. Right. Rentals won't net you that. But it's a business and it's work. And so you got to have a team involved. And I do have a team. I got somebody that that uh, interfaces with the uh, guests when they book. I've got a, a cleaning crew. I got a, a main, yard maintenance crew. And I also have uh, I, <laughs> I, I discovered something that's a valuable asset is a mobile notary. You know, no, right. they know how to look at documents and sign things and they know how to follow instructions. So I, I had one come to me for a close and I said, why don't you come to work for me? And she said, all right, I will. And so she she does. That's part of the automation, you know, is part of the delegation, rather. But she actually so this is the gal that helps me in my real estate business. But she greets them. So she knows when they ask them when they're checking in. She she's the second set of eyes that go into that house before they get there. Right. And if, you know, if the trash can's still out in the street or whatever, whatever it is, she, she hands it and meets them. And we're just trying to get that five-star experience. I, I tell you, Connor, I started four years ago with our lake house that you've been to, right. and I wanted to have access to it and I wanted it to pay for itself. And the only, only thing I could think of, see if I rented it full time, I wouldn't have access. It would pay for itself, but I did. So I wanted access when I want to go out there and get on the boat. So we can block the dates anytime we want to or use it for my purposes. We have events out there sometime. And so it, I just kind of failed. I stumbled into it. Right. And now and the, the rest of them are more deliberate. I'm buying, when I buy a house for Airbnb specifically, I buy it in a commercial overlay zone because I think one day the zoning in Jackson is going to make an issue out of this. Right. As I have in many other yeah, cities. You, yeah, you're seeing it in other places. But, I mean, people have been doing short-term rentals and vacation rentals forever. But because of Airbnb now centralizing and consolidating everybody into one local area, you're able to fill these properties a lot easier. Because until they kind of came out, I think it's too difficult for most people to continuously fill their properties because they had no, they couldn't dip into the market share. But now, I mean, you could have a property in Florida and Colorado and L.A., wherever you wanted all the places you wanted to say you go every year for two to three weeks or have friends go for uh, holidays or vacations and just Airbnb the rest of the year. And so it's allowed investors to basically go anywhere they want now, which I think is really cool. Well, and it also lets you buy houses that you normally wouldn't buy. Right. They wouldn't fit your criteria necessarily, your past criteria. Right, right. Right. And I tell you, the rental arbitrage that you sent that video out early on, where I, the real play is not buying the house, but leasing it from somebody that can't sell their house. For example, they got a furnished but vacant house. Right. You, you know those. And so go make a deal, just split it with them. I'll put it on Airbnb and allow you to keep, keep it on the market. Let's have a 60 day uh, out of their agreement and just split. I'll, I'll do all the work and we'll split the profits. Right. And, and I, I realize that because my neighbor next door, let his furnished vacant house sit there for a year and a half and he could have easily done it, but he just didn't know how to do it. Right. It's not that hard, but it is a learning curve. Walter, is your, uh, what's your YouTube channel? Is it just Walter Wilford or is it a financial friends network or yeah, all of the above? Cause, uh, cause he put out a, a really good video. That's got a whole bunch of views on short term. Um, what'd you call it? Short term arbitrage or, Rental arbitrage. Rental Short arbitrage. Rental arbitrage. Yeah, so guys, go check that out. Make sure to subscribe to this channel and leave a good review. Um, but yeah, that's a really good video that explains more in depth what we're talking about because I don't think, you know, a lot of people are talking about Airbnb is going to be a fad and it's going to disappear. I, I just don't see it. I think it's going to, unless they make some massive regulation stopping it, but I really just, I don't see how they could. You know, I don't see, like, how could they really regulate it? Do you see it's, any? It's, it's out. Right. The cows are, the horses are out. Well, I tell you, and, and see, you know, it started with renting a room in your house, right? That's how that whole movement. And we bought a house, you you saw it, I'm sitting in the living room right now, but just above me is an exterior entrance, one bedroom apartment, okay? So we could rent that uh, probably for $800. It would include the utilities, if we just put a college student or somebody in there full time, but if we rent it on Airbnb, we'll double that. So the question is, which do you want? And so let's just say 600 is the net. Do you want 600 net or you want 1200 net? And then when you apply that towards your mortgage payment, that's okay. Right. 
I mean, I even heard about when they had the Super Bowl, people were renting out bean bags in a room for like one hundred fifty dollars a night. They just throw like those giant bean bags out, and people were huh. literally coming in and paying all that money. So I mean, it's just how creative you want to get, and if you got a place for people to stay, you know, people people are looking for affordable traveling outlets that they can come and, and not have to drop a bunch at a hotel. Um, I guess the most common question I get when it comes to Airbnb is about scalability and also about, you know, obviously everybody knows that you can make more in cash flow, but the time issue, do you spend more time doing it? Have you looked at cost comparison? Have you really looked at your time into it? Is it, is it easier just to go buy more rental properties or create more notes? Or do you think the long-term play with these Airbnbs because you're actually paying down the asset. So like with a note, you, if it gets paid off, you lose the asset where the Airbnb let's, pays down. All right. Let me ask you this uh, for you. To, so let's just say you were going to you wanted to get ten thousand dollars a month in rental income, right. whether it be Airbnb or otherwise. So I could do that with 10 houses with Airbnb. How many houses would it take to get that? Maybe 100. Yeah, you're looking at like probably 35 at least. For most people, you know, net, 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 you know, a lot of people play paper tiger millionaire, you know, but really, yeah, it's a, it's a lot more houses for sure. So it's less houses, and, but it's work. I would don't sugarcoat that at all. It's work. And I deal with it every day, first thing in the morning. But it's, it, it, i tell you what else. It's a good thing. Let me pull this out and see if I can show it. <laughs> it's a good thing. Let's say, where's this thing? So I get, you get to choose how you get paid with an Airbnb. Well, I can't find it. In here somewhere. There it is. So let's put it right here. So you see that? <laughs> so that's a debit card. And so the day after they check in, I get paid. So there is not a collection uh, issue with this business. You can't say that about the rental business. Right. No right. collections. Paid right there. <laughs> right. I mean, I think it's a great model. You know, I think we'll probably pick up a couple this year. I forget you said something one time. You're like, I just keep trying to spend my money, but Airbnb keeps filling it back up or filling my bank account back up or something like that. But um, well, uh, it's not uncommon at all to have. Uh, well, if you're going to net a thousand, that means you get a lot more than a thousand per property, right? Right. So you know, it's it's not uncommon to have ten thousand a month hit that card. I mean, like it, it, it completely throws everything we knew about rental valuation out the window, right? Because now, I mean, depending on how you look at it, you can pay a lot more for a property if it's in the right area because your cash on cash returns higher. So, well, and not only that, if I ever wanted to get out of the business, now I got a business I can sell that's not appraisal. Right. This is a bit, you know, so it's, and I think it, I could sell them for about 30% more than what it would appraise because it's a business. Right. How about that? I like that. <laughs> Do you think that uh, the banks will eventually look at these as far as, you know, you come in with an application, you're saying you're going to Airbnb this property, that they'll give you a higher loan to value against it because you're generating more income against the property? Or do you think that's going to, they're only going to look at the market rents for? I don't know anything about qualifying for a bank loan. Sorry. <laughs> right. I got out of that system a long time ago. Right, right. I mean, I guess the only thing, you know, I would, urge people to do is that if you are going to Airbnb property, at least make sure it cash flows or at least breaks even on the, on the backside if you did have to finance out or if you did have to, to rent it as a long-term rental because um, that keeps your, your risk at a minimum. Um, well, not only that, you got, you got a shot at marketing to people real time, real person. So my reader will show up with, with a flyer or a little that might have some coupons in it. My, my favorite restaurants. And she's going to put it in their hands and say, Walter wanted you to have this. And, of course, it's promoting me. I talk about IRAs and affordable housing. And I would even uh, tell them if they're coming here to, to find a home, if, if you go and utilize either one of my sons that are both realtors, uh, you can stay for free if you go let them go find your house. Right. Now, who would do that? <laughs> right, right. I mean – I think it's an amazing strategy. I think you're going to see a lot of people do big things with it. So, I mean, I guess if you have good time management skills, good a good ability to create systems and stay organized, this strategy can be incredibly profitable for you. But if if you're having trouble with your time management and, and creating systems, this can be, it seems like it could be a headache. So it just really depends on it the- It is a headache. Yeah. It's a business. Right. <laughs> well, you got to, you can, you can, uh, 
you can limp along with one or two without systems. But when you get three or four or five, you got to have systems. Right. Well, I mean, I think what's cool is, I mean, like you're seeing all sorts of different options for people to monetize properties that they have that they could have never done before. So you've got, you know, even you with Airstreams, you've got people who have um, exterior garage units that they turned into uh, rentals in the back of their property. So there's a lot of opportunity for people. And even like at your house right now, you got, they're going to renovate that upstairs one bedroom. I mean, it just adds extra room for cash flow, right? On properties that you weren't monetizing in those ways already. So it's, it's just an extra club in the bag. I see it. Well, just think about this. If you had an exterior, uh, if you had some room or some area, like a garage apartment, Right. Like my son's got a, a a perfect scenario. He hadn't put the plumbing in it yet. The uh, but it's a it's a detached, separate from the house, about 400 square feet. Right. Right. So he could go in there and doll it up and rent it out. He he could probably rent that out for seventy dollars a night. Well, if you if you average twenty per night, that's getting awfully close to a mortgage payment, isn't it? Right. Well, I mean, you've seen this before, like people, what they used to do is they would rent out, you know, the back, those spaces in the back of their properties for storage units, or they would just rent the space for people to keep their stuff and at maybe $150, $200 a month. And now they can get $70 a day. I mean, it's just a no brainer, right? It's just increase the about, it's just increase the investor's ability to make more income off the same properties that they already have. And a lot of people have units on their properties right now that they could turn into Airbnbs. Well, all right, so here's when you get older, you start thinking about residual income, right? Uh, I didn't think about that for about the first 30 years of my career. <laughs> but, uh, you know, because wholesalers just buy and sell, buy and sell, and they get good at it, and it's the highest tax activity you can have. But it's a job, it's a business. Right. Airbnb, short term rentals, is a business, but What's I think it's the quickest way to get to ten thousand a month of anything you could do today, and have residual. Now you can go buy sell a house for ten thousand, but you got to go do it again next month right. and next month, <laughs> and you got to go find you know it's got to go kill it and skin it and eat it every month. <laughs> right. I don't have to do that with this business, and that, that's what appeals to me about it. Right, and some people just don't like having a lot of debt on their shoulders. So you know, I mean, to own forty, fifty houses with notes on them versus having fewer houses, but larger cash flow can be a lot more comfortable situation for a lot of investors. You know, Connor, if I were starting today, I would go learn about leasing, corporate leasing with the right to sublease. I wouldn't even buy a house. Right, right. I think it's That's a great exactly idea. exactly what I would do. Right. So let's talk about that a little bit. So basically, you're, you're master leasing someone else's rental property. So say you could Airbnb the property for 1500 but some investor in your area is renting it for 800 you would do what? You would go to them and say, I want to make an agreement with you. Let me handle all the backside. And Yeah. Well, it, it's not even that complex. My, I sold one of my sons a house out at the reservoir. It, so it's got water view back there. It's a three-bedroom, two-bath. He rents it for 1100 a month and has for the last five or six years. I went to him and said, Damon, when you've got a tenant rolling over, rolling out of that thing, let me become your tenant. I'll pay you 1000 a month corporate rental, and I'll take care of all the repairs. Right. No vacancy, no collection, no repairs. Is he making more money or not? Right. Yeah. And then I would go, general, now I've got to pay for utilities. He'd still pay for the taxes. But I could, I could generate up to 2500 on that property per month. And so let's say we've got a $500 cost. I'm making $1,000, and he's making $1,000. No, he's not making a thousand dollars because he's got cost against that. Right. Taxes and insurance and debt if he has it. But that's a really good play right there. Oh, Who would do that? It's huge. I mean, it's incredible to be honest, because now, you know, you have new investors that weren't financeable. Um, they can go out there instead of having to start at wholesaling. Everybody wants to get into real estate for the cash flow. And similar to how, how Uber is, they don't have a, a fleet of yellow taxi cabs inventory that they have to maintain. They're just an app. It's the same thing. You know, with Airbnb, they can go master lease a property so they don't have to own the property. They're just controlling the property, yet they're making cash flow off a property that they have no liabilities toward. So, Connor, I'm moving in a direction of the corporate leasing because they stay longer. They're, uh, you know, companies paying for it. 
Uh, so, you, for example, right now, um, well, next month I got some med students coming. We live near the medical center. They're going to stay for two and a half months. Wow. All right. So that's good. My number two son rents also to the medical center people. They have rotating surgeons that come through there and they know who they are. You know, they rotate around. And so he has a constant stream of people saying three months at a time. Yep. And, and so what he did is he took, he's got uh, his office in a, in a house that was built for residential on a commercial that is now commercial overlay. He moved his office to the front of the building and he rents out the back Airbnb and makes about $1,800 a month on a one bedroom house. Yeah. How about that? I mean, I think it's great. I mean, I think, you know, some of the best areas, guys, if you're trying to figure out if it, Airbnb is good for you, I mean, like what you just said, by hospital, by colleges, um, by sports stadiums, um, anywhere that's got a high volume of people coming into your market that aren't traditionally there, you know, traveling in left and right um, is where I'm seeing most people have really good success. Also, some of y'all right now may have rental properties that you're struggling to cash flow. This could be your exit out of it. You know, you could be able to turn it into an Airbnb and that may be able to get you cash flow positive. So I think it's a great strategy for sure. Well, we got two colleges, not to mention the med center within one mile right. of our, of our Airbnb rentals. If we did nothing but cater to the parents of the students that are, you know, I got to go see my kid a couple of times a year. Right. Right. No, I mean, niche, niche. Right. And who, I mean, who, who would want to really, I mean, think about it. who wants to go stay in a hotel when they basically can go stay in Airbnb and have a grill out back and do whatever they want and have the privacy to live their life as they would if they were at home. Okay, guys, we lost Walter there for a second, but we're back here. We're going to talk about something that's incredibly important for investors to understand, which is what's called an inherited Roth IRA or stretch IRA. All you understand that in the beginning, it's tough to make money and your main focus is how to make money. But then as you start to make a lot of money in this business, your main focus is how to keep it and avoid paying a lot of taxes. So let's talk about the inherited Roth IRA, Walter, because you're the first person to introduce this to me, you and Quincy. And I think that's what a lot of investors could say. And um, it's just a huge opportunity for investors who kind of want to leverage their, their business a little bit more. All right. So let's go down memory lane, history. Okay. <laughs> So uh, the traditional IRAs were introduced by Congress in the 70s. And then uh, in the 90s, they introduced the Roth IRA. So we got two basic kinds of individual re retirement accounts. One is you get a deduction when you put it in and you pay taxes when you take it out. That's traditional. The Roth is just the opposite. You don't get a deduction when you put it in, but when you take it out, after it grows, there are no taxes to it. But to, to, for a qualified distribution, meaning no tax, no penalty for the Roth IRA, you got to meet two tests. It's got to be open for five years, and, you, and you've got to be 59 and a half or older. That's the rules. All right, so I'm older than that, so it doesn't matter. Right. But where does the inherited Roth? So the inherited rules have been around that basically, whether it's traditional or Roth, they're the same rules. It means that. If you inherit a Roth, the waiting until 59 and a half rule goes away. So, for example, if you inherited one from somebody had already had their account open for five years, then you would receive it. Connor would receive it and it would be your account now. Now, you can't add anything to it, no more contributions, but you could move it to a self-directed company like Quest IRA. And then you could use your skill and your knowledge in your real estate arena and a lot of other things to make investments using your skill set. So, for example, you're a wholesaler, right? Well, let's just say you want to keep one. Keep one as a rental. So you get a good deal because you're a wholesaler and your inherited rate buys the house as a rental. Okay? So the income today that comes in for a season, one that had been open five years, uh, is not taxable at your age, Connor. That's the point, right. at your age. All right. right, you got it? So you don't, the, 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 the main benefit of an inherited Roth IRA is the 59 and a half year rule goes away. Right, so, so essentially I can take the money out with checkbook control and spend it if I wanted to go buy 
whatever, right? So I could go buy materials for my property or I could go buy clothes or I could go buy a car. Is this going to well, be a problem? It doesn't matter what you spend it on. Right, right. It just, uh, so that's and a lot of people take advantage of that. I know a lot of people that have only Roth IRA income. Right. It makes their tax reporting a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> well, the issue is, you know, a lot of people just don't understand how to grow a small IRA, which is why they need to come to your event because you and some of the people there, some of these speakers that are there, are some of the only people in the country that really know how to do this, right? And so that's the big issue. I think a lot of people could put themselves in a situation to inherit an IRA, but what, how are they going to work it? How are they going to grow it? You know, and you need to understand what you're doing. Um, and so talking to a Quincy or a Walter, you know, you got to find someone that knows what they're doing, right? So let's talk about maybe one way or two, how to grow a small IRA and then what to expect at the event. And, and right, so I'll be, I'll be, I'll just, I'm just one came to mind and you ever show up at a real estate meeting and say, I got $30,000 to lend at 12% interest only for a year. Got to be well secured. How many takers, how many people would take that if you showed up? Probably a lot of them. All right. So I can be a, a private lender to you for $30,000 as long as I'm happy with the collateral. Now, what I would do, now, now follow this because you take, Let's just say you take um, $250 out of your inherited Roth IRA, and then you go ask somebody else if they want to put up $29,750. Right. All right, so this person is happy with an 8% return. You're, you're loaning at 12% interest. That's what we said, right? And so $30,000, that's $3,600 a year, $300 a month. So... This guy is going to get 8% return out of that $300. This one is getting the rest. And just so you won't be confused about the math, the inherited Roth IRA gets $100 a month for 12 months, interest only, and then gets their money back. But they would combine, you can, you can joint venture with other IRAs and non-IRAs. So there are people that would love to get their money working at 8% who would like to come along and you, you source the deal. And we would use an entity to hold that as lender. Right. And it could be a trust or it could be an LLC. It could be a lot of things, but that's could Is that clear? Did I explain what that was? No, I think you did a great job because I think people don't understand. Let's talk about this a little bit, you know, running a business versus, you know, having an investment out of your IRA. Cause people don't understand that, you know, even though you can do investments out of your IRA, there's prohibited transactions. You have to do it correctly. You have to stay in compliance. Um, so what he was ex explaining was he's getting away from running a business and he's just doing a straight investment by doing it that way, right? And it's a 12-month deal. And so if they pay it off earlier, then we still get our $3,600. Right, right. So you're going to have a speech there on inheritance, or are you going to go over this quite a bit? Oh, yeah, we're going to go over it in, in detail. And there's a lot of information that Quincy and I put out. But it, where does that technique come into for the affordable housing play? And I want to tell you. So I'm trying to encourage other people to do this in my town, right? So if they find a house that they can buy for 30 but they got a tenant in there that doesn't want to buy it, so they need some time to roll the tenant out and get a homeowner in there, right? Right. 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 And so you see how this $30,000 as a loan secured by that particular purchase of $30,000 would be that that's why we need this 12 months money. It's 12% interest and they can afford it. So for example, the, the house I have in mind, there's an existing tenant paying $800 a month. Could they afford $300 a month as a payment for 12 months? Yeah, they can afford it. And so it's kind of a interim financing. It's not 90-day financing, and it's not 100-payment financing. It's in between, and that's a perfect play for an IRA who's got, let's just say they've got, got somebody else in their life that needs to get an 8% return on their money, and they don't want to put it in the stock market, right? <laughs> So that you combine your joint venture, and we're going to talk a lot about that. Right, right. So you're also going to talk about how to structure um, these purchases. You're going to talk about how to do it in a trust, how to do it correctly. 
um, and the whole process, right, and all the paperwork that goes along with this, because this is not just something that you go with a one-page assignment contract and make a lowball cash offer. You got to know what you're doing. It's you know, so you're going to go over the entire process of how you do this at the event. Well, let's spend three days talking about it. <laughs> right. I and mean, it's not just me talking about it. We got some great, of course, you're going to be speaking twice on uh, you, social media marketing. We got Quincy Long that'll be with Quest IRA. He'll be, uh, we are talking about it yesterday, about what, what we're going to teach, what trust we're going to teach. And he, he's, he knows everything about everything. Right. Just ask him. He knows it. And then we got uh, Tom Olson's coming and Mo Matthews coming and uh, Rich Lennon's coming. We got Kevin Strock coming. So all these guys are buddies around the country, and I need them to help me present this this thought. So all the topics relate back to the – really, it's the impact investor. And right. you can take this and move it back to your market if the, your market will work for that or – you can use it here in Jackson, and I'll help you do it. Now, what do you got to have? Can we talk about elements in there? Yep, yep. Got a little yep. more time? So if you got to have somebody to source the deals, right? So there are plenty of wholesalers that will be there. They're out there finding deals. Then we got to have a property manager if your IRA, if you're going to have it for 12 months and then sell it. So we got several property managers that will be there. Of course, they're going to be my sons, of course, right? <laughs> And then, uh, then you got to have contractors, so there'll be some contractors there, and uh, the I represent custodial represent rep, uh, Quincy will be there. Then what else do we need? Well, we need a way to find the homeowner buyers and qualify. I mean, we got lots of people that are going to talk about different ways of finding and qualifying homeowner buyers in our market. Then what do you need? Then you got to have the document prep done the documents on this transaction because we're using trust when we buy and sell. So a typical transaction might be 50 pages of documents. Now, how do you get those things done quickly? Well, we're going to talk about the automation right. of that. And I used to do, it used to take me three hours of my time to do it. Now it takes me 10 minutes because of the automation that's involved. And then, so what do you need next? Well, you got to have insurance. So we got national real estate invest uh, insurance group is coming and they're going to talk about what you need as insurance. A big company, they insure 95,000 houses in the United States. Then we got a loan servicer coming. You got to have a loan servicer if you're going to scale this business. So we got a representative from National Asset Mortgage that'll be there. So it's going to be what I've tried to do is get everything that you would need in one spot so I can empower you to go in your, go to do it in your home or come and do it in Jackson because that's really what I'm after. Right, right. And guys, this is one of the best events you're going to go to all year. I mean, just some of those names he mentioned there. Plus, guys, I'm going to be down there if you want to come meet me. Um, this is not one of those events where you're getting suckered into and then they're going to not give you any information for three days and then they're going to hit you with a fifty or $100,000 you know, TV consulting package or whatever this is. This is real investors talking about real strategies, high-end strategies, networking, masterminding all weekend. And uh, I mean, for the price... <laughs> I mean, I don't know where you're going to get this type of information. This could literally change your life, some of the things you're learning down there. Um, so how do they sign up? We'll, we'll put a link below here. It's the Mississippi Affordable Housing Summit.com, right? Yeah, it's not the. It's Mississippi Affordable Housing Summit.com. And so we got the tickets. They're uh, six ninety seven for one. You're going to get some meals with that. And, of course, all the materials we'll have. The first night we'll gather at my house. I'll feed you some good old southern cooking. And then uh, – you also have a chance for, we've got about, oh, maybe 10 more rooms available. I, what I did is I blocked off my Airbnbs and went to my buddies in town. I said, look, I need your Airbnb. You can come to the seminar. So I, we got extra Airbnbs. And so we're going to charge $150 for four nights, one person or one bed. Two people can stay in a bed, but it's $150. You can't stay that cheap anywhere. Right. And so we got a, a limited amount, so I want to encourage you to sign up. For that. Right. So guys, I mean, there's a ton of information out there on wholesaling, flipping, landlording, but where are you going to go to learn about creative financing, trust, IRAs, specifically the inherited stretch IRA? I mean, we're going to be talking about Airbnb, social media. I mean, it's going to be a great event. Um, all I can say is I'm going to be there. You should be there. If you're not coming, I don't know what you're doing, right? So uh, is there anything else you want to talk about, Walter, while I got you here? Or um, just... Well, we went over already. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably enough. We we did some scatter shot today. 
Uh, I'm I'm active in the business every day. I eat and breathe and work 12 hours every day on this business in Jackson. And if I can help you, if I can pass along to you some of my scars that I have had that to, for you to avoid getting the scars and just focus on your successes, uh, I'm giving you a template right. that is, has been proven to work. I mean, uh, guys, I mean, a lot of y'all follow me and see what I do, but you got to understand, I follow Walter and see what Walter does. So think about that. You can come down and meet Walter and Quincy and some of these guys, spend the weekend with us, get to learn some of these strategies that you don't know anything about. I mean, it's hard for us in, in a 45-minute podcast to go over what's going to be going on on a three-day weekend, but trust, IRAs, Airbnb, guys, it's, it's, it's going to be a good event. Um, we'll put all the links and everything below. We'll, we'll get this out there, hopefully... Um, get some people coming down there and uh, guys we'll see you on the next episode all righty connor thank you all right thanks walter